people keep asking me like what my big plan was and why I wrote this play and why I was interested in Marie Antoinette and I'm really I never had an interest in Marie Antoinette. I'm not a history buff. I'm I know a few things about a lot of things and I'm a little bit of a dilettante and um, I don't know why I wrote this play. It's very unsatisfying to answer because um, I didn't have I was at an artist colony and I was reading a book and in the book someone mentioned Marie Antoinette and it was almost like my eyes lasered in and I just knew at that moment that I was going to write this play and I literally shut the book and went to the library in New Hampshire and got out a bunch of books and like children's books not like really like tomes I mean and I got like Pokeville and a few things just to contextualize the historical moment but I knew I didn't want to write a history play I knew I wanted to do something a little more lysergic and personal and open. And so um, I just thought I'll cram it, I'll get a timeline, and then I'm just going to do it really, really quickly. And I'd done that once before with a, uh, a very early play of mine. That was the first thing that ever got produced. And so I thought, I just felt that I should do that with this play. So the whole thing was really written in a week from conception to finishing. And then I called Sarah Benson. <laughs> at the Soho Rep, because I was, I was supposed to do another play for the Soho Rep lab, because I was in the lab, and I said, I can't do that play, but I wrote this other play, but it's about Marie Antoinette. Can I give it to you? And she said, okay. So um, I had the reading of the play the next week. <laughs> so it was just crazy. And um, sometimes things are very gnomic when, when you're a writer. You don't know why what's happening. You just go with the flow. You know? And it all just came out of you. It came out. I mean... I was inspired by um, the details of the story, like, struck me as so crazy and so absurd and actually it resonated with me, like, in terms of the world of my writing, just the absurdity of her life and the pathos and the heartbreak and the emptiness and the anony. I mean, it all feels, it felt like my world. So I didn't really think about it too much, but I knew that it, there was like a magnet there for my stuff. To come out, and I, I feel like I wrote really something very more personal than historical. And Rebecca, in terms of this uh, kind of amazing open environment we're sitting in, I'm curious: how did you and the team come to this? Come to what we're sitting in? We were gonna. Can you guys? Can you, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm trying. How's that? I'm a late to you. Um, we were gonna. Well, we we did. We've done this play twice before at Yale Rep and at ART in Boston, and we had done this sort of huge, very lavish production. And when we found out that we were going to do it here, we were of course totally thrilled. And we immediately said we need to reconceive the whole thing. I mean, to try to import that kind of gigantic for like a huge proscenium in here would be really ludicrous. So we set about kind of going, okay, well, what's a, you know, what's a really exciting way to use the intimacy that this space creates? Um, we were originally going to do this. We were going to originally put it in a white box. This entire room was going to be like a very pristine, and I can't even imagine the claustrophobia we might have all felt in that white box. But we were going to sort of really like shut it completely off um, and create this like very odd sort of surreal envelope that sort of suffocating space. And then we suddenly, I mean, it just like, you know, over much dialogue, I think it was like a 2 a.m. phone call, I really do, where suddenly we were like, what if we just did one of the walls and we left the space really, really raw and if we were really honest, kind of uh, just authentic about making a play, and th that we're like we're never sort of pretending in a way that we are actually living the experience, we're presenting the experience, and there was something incredibly invigorating and enlivening about that idea, about really opening up the raw, the raw room, and just being like acknowledging this is the beautiful, odd, wonderful room that we're in, and then have this kind of like. I, sort of a monument in a way, um, like I, I, I was kind of hoping it would feel like it had oddly sort of dropped in here and it made no sense in here. 
you know, that there's some very like heightened contrast between this like very severe, very modern, very conceptual wall and this like very, very raw space. And I guess we were thinking about that as a way of bringing, in a, in a sense of bringing out like the terrible contradictions of her life. And you know, the, the contradictions of the, that the, that the play is really digging into this like, you know, enormous wealth and profound unhappiness. So, so we were, I mean, it's been, it's been for me as a director and I'm still processing it. It's been an incredible gift. I've never quite had this experience before and I've learned so much and it's really amazing how the architecture of a space can affect the experience of a play. I mean, it really profoundly and I love I just, as an audience member, love being this close to these extraordinary actors. And there's, it's really an enormous gift to kind of breathe it with them, so. And how did that proximity change uh, your interaction with the actors in the rehearsal room? I mean, I think there's a difference between knowing you have to send some like like me right now like i'm trying to send something like far over you know when we turn that off i mean so you you can become much closer together it takes the volume of energy is actually different it requires a kind of a different it's interesting what being in a large huge auditorium does if you really want to send something so that the entire room can feel it so there was a real focus for us this time on like the human scale and on nuance and on subtlety and sort of you know what 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 can because we're just right with you you know you really don't have to kind of <laughs> new, goodbye. you don't have to push um so it was a very so it was a it was a sometimes when you move from the rehearsal room onto the stage there's kind of a shock to the system and this felt like, oh, it was so thrilling. You know, it was like being in a rehearsal space in a way. It was very, very intimate. I don't know if that answers mm -hmm. your question. And David, you, you've, you guys have done a very maximalist version of this play and now a very minimalist version of this play. I'm curious, what, what did you see in your mind's eye when you got it out? Was it something on that spectrum? Well, I wrote it thinking I was going to do a real a spectacle. I thought, okay, great, this will be a big spectacle. And that's what the first two productions really were. So, um, yeah, I wanted to write, I wanted to do something that was just really visual and really kind of nuts and surreal and, um, and idiosyncratic individuals. And I really was thinking, oh, you could do something extraordinary in terms of just creating the visual landscape. And then, and then we did it, and it was really pretty. And she's really... The, the, the great thing about this production is like for anyone who knows Rebecca's work, she really is like a, a master of creating visual images and that's what she's known for and rightly, you know? And so I was just so proud, like we both decide like let's just like completely, completely, completely pull back and really just do this in this space. And what it freed up was so surprising to both of us. Like it's not just claptrap, it's not just like, oh, we're doing a talk back. It was literally like we're both kind of going, wow, wow. You know, like we feel like we um, we're in graduate school again. I mean, I don't know, I feel that way because it's real, it's real learning. Mm -hmm. It's a real kind of learning. And it's also questioning your values, we're really questioning our values as artists, like what kind of work matters to us and what kind of storytelling do we want to do and what really can really affect an audience and how do we want to engage with an audience. And, um, you know, like in the first production, we had constant costume changes from Rhi, and it was like this and that and blah, blah, blah. And in this, it's just like she's in this dress. And it's like, yeah, do you need to actually know that she dressed into a million dresses <laughs> over the course of 30 years, you know? You know that she dressed in those. So we're creating this iconography, and, um, and it's not literal, you know? And the play is not literal. And so, Slowly but surely, we have been learning about, you know, who we both really kind of are and like what we really believe in and not hiding behind certain things that we, we could do really good, you know? And it's been very, it's been really rewarding. I, I love your point about iconography and that brings me to my last question before we open it up. 
Um, so her rep has produced David's work in the past. We did a play, Elective Affinities, uh, with Zoe Caldwell, uh, a solo, which we produced on the Upper East Side by the Met Museum. Um, and I think that there's a sort of theme with these amazing women, the sort of duality. You have Alice in that play, who's extremely prim and very proper, and she's really a sort of tiger inside. And then you have um, Blanche, the black maid, and stunning, who uh, comes across as very empathetic, but is really like a con artist um, on, on the flip side. So I'm curious, you know, Marie is another of these sort of amazing dualistic creations. How, how does she fit into that spectrum of these amazing women? I think these women would all hate each other. I feel like if they were at a party, they would all go to the opposite end of the room. Like, I was trying to imagine Alice with Marie Antoinette and Stephen Chisel. They would hate each other's guts. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's more like, like, I need to go to analysis or something. I mean, I don't really know why I write these kinds of, I'm attracted to, I mean, I grew up around very outsized women in my, like, very intense female characters in my life. And um, I was raised by them, so uh, I think I'm drawn to these kinds of people, and um, and I'm drawn I'm drawn to um, I feel like over the course of my life I've had to find ways to connect with people who uh, whose behavior I found sometimes appalling, and in the process of doing that, I really learned a lot about. Like I, 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 I was forced to dig a little bit deeper into people and it opened up something in me. And so I found that incredibly rewarding and painful also. But then I think, I, so I feel like that's kind of, that's the kind of experience that I want to share with people. And it's not just with female characters, but just in general, uh, you know, and you know, I like, you know, I like the idea that People, people have such an interesting relationship with wealthy, with wealth and with money because they want it, but then they also revile people that have it. And, um, and just a lot of issues come up around money. And also like with Marie Antoinette in particular, she's, um, there's this multivalence in the culture about her because she keeps coming up again and again and she's always in the zeitgeist and she always is refracting some cultural issue through her thing, but no one really knows how to feel about her. Like, they dress up as her, and they kind of think it's cute, and they think it's kind of cool because she's an enfant to read, but then they also think she's horrible, and she's insensitive, and she's awful, and selfish, and um, and she and she weirdly, and I'm saying this to you, that she really does represent, like, this weird spectrum of ambivalence uh, that encompasses the American dream, you know, and I find that really that that's really interesting. And that was not something I intended, but I just think it's interesting the contradictions that adhere in the culture about who we want to be or who we think we should be, and what we detest about what we think we should be and what we aspire to be. It's interesting. I don't know if that answers that question. I just yeah, no. this is what I do with these things. I just free associate for two hours. So, so well said. Well, on that note, can I open it up? If anyone has any questions to, for either of these two wonderful artists, Matt. I was going to use the connect, and, and get a, I, like that. What I don't like to get involved with this. At what point are you in Ireland? So the question is, um, how did Rebecca and David connect, and when did Marin come into this particular process? Well, I I was just saying this to her the other day. <laughs> we were doing another play. Oh, no. We met. Should I tell? Not, I won't say it. No, say it. I'll say, I just think it's funny because I just I just said it to her for the first time the other night. We were doing a play in New Haven, and we met in 2006. We did this other play called The Evil Doers, which was a crazy, crazy, very Brilliant. difficult play. Brilliant. And um, and I was walking down the street in New Haven, and I said, um, you know, I have this other play, Marie Antoinette. I just wrote. Do you want to look at it? And it was like radio silence. <laughs> like we're just walking. She said nothing, and I thought, oh, okay, she probably like hates me <laughs> or something. But I, I think she just didn't hear I didn't me. Hear, I don't. I, have I don't no think she didn't hear me. Moment. Moment. I never uh, brought it up again. Literally, I have no. I never brought it up I again. I think I must not have heard because I, if I had heard, I am so excited by David as a writer, I would have left. But it was literally like radio silence. We were just walking, and I was like, so then, um, so then. Uh, 
you know, and then many, I mean, this play has been around, you know, I wrote it in 2006. So it's been around for a while. I had done a bunch of workshops and I, I knew Marin very vaguely from a uh, New York theater workshop. And, uh, and uh, but I didn't really know her as an actor. And one day I was in New Dramatist, where so I'm, I'm a writer, a, a resident, and she was doing a reading by a friend of mine. He said, would you come and look at this reading that I'm doing? I'm not inviting anyone. I just want you and two other people to watch it. And I said, okay. And it was a monologue and it was just Marin. And she played like three different people and they kept switching tone. It was really amazing. And it was like electrifying what she was doing in this room. I was like, who is this actor? I couldn't believe she wasn't like world famous. And the, uh, the next month I got a, a workshop in, in Portland and I, I called her and I said, listen, we don't know each other that well, but I wrote this play. Would you look at it? I want you to do this workshop in Portland. And then she read it and she said yes. And so she did it. And we did about five workshops over the course of I don't know how many years. We just kept doing week-long workshops. And uh, and she just did all of them, you know? And we just kept waiting for someone to do the play. And um, and finally, when Yale uh, agreed to do it, Rebecca got on board and, and then we all did it. <laughs> <laughs> that time I heard the question. Actually, <laughs> no, David, D David uh, sent me called me somehow, I don't know how you found me, but found me a long time, oh, a long time before, ago, yeah. and sent me this really brilliant play of his called Evil Doers. And I, you know, I, I read plays a lot, and this play, I just, I really was astounded when I opened it. Just by the first page, you could see, I was this writer who's writing music, actually music, with language, and it kind of, in an astounding way. And playing with form in a in a way that's very unique and kind of fierce, very 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 funny. So I I was shocked to read his work and you know and and been very honored to get to to work with him. Needless to say, yes. Um, so I just have a question, but I have an observation. I love the idea of the sheep, and as the play was going on, I think how everyone is taking the sheep. Um, <laughs> right from Marie Antoinette, who just is following the path of the people, and the people who are out there riding, and so are sheep, like the Henry Bob, just following the rotation. And the sheep themselves, like all sheep, like how that rotation. The woman is commenting about the character of the sheep and how uh, sort of inventive it is. Right. And the other thing when you like I'm very fascinated with money on planet and the thing I think that fascinates me, uh, a professor of mine is working on make your gods and break your gods. And I think we do that with all our celebrities because we build them up into something that's not really there and then we love tear mm -hmm. them down. And we do that over and over and over again. I wonder what says that about ourselves. We project ourselves like we want to other she was just speaking about um, building up celebrity and building them up and building them up until we inevitably have to tear them down. And did David have a comment about that? I mean, I think these are great observations and both very true. And I think that, uh, I don't know, I just think of it in terms of this culture. There's such a, um, I mean, there's this long tradition, this history of American, the desire for American perfectibility. You know, and this uh, notion that we can be great and we can do all these things and um, we can keep exceeding ourselves and exceeding ourselves. And um, I mean, uh, I just think a lot about Michael Jackson and sort of like what he did, like like this plastic surgery, like, oh, we can he can be even better and look better and more perfect and more perfect. And then he becomes kind of dehumanized. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And his iconography exceeds him to the point where it just crushes him. And, um, you know, I think like anything, I mean, we're a mirror. These celebrities are our mirror and we mirror them. And um, there's an enormous amount of self-loathing in this culture and uh, people just feel they need to become something, you know? And, you know, that's this. Um, so, you know, this is the story of, I think, a, a woman who was so lonely and so empty and so lost and was so betrayed and so abandoned by the people that were supposed to care for her and that she just could only um, 
seek recourse in trying to invent herself into something. And that thing kind of smothers her. So, and the culture participates in it, you know? So it's, it's sad, it's sad. Anyone else? So the question was, when did the sheep um, make its presence felt in the play in David's writing process? Yeah. I'm not really like a talking animals kind of person. You know, like, I'm not. I don't think it's cute to be like, you know, I think I'm going to do a talking animal. Like, it's not the kind of writer I am. Um, but if a talking animal inserts himself <laughs> into my writing, I can't not do it. You know what I mean? And so I wrote it so quickly that when I got to the, the Hamo scene, I, um, where, she's, where the sheep talks to her, I just went, I mean, I just had to go with it. And then my unconscious, like, I started to, like, piece together what my unconscious wanted to do. And I started under, to understand that this play was about sheep and also about nature and culture and about this woman trying to mine and uh, exhume her own nature, figure out what that is exactly and who she should be and what her essential self is. And, um, and that was something that was really being investigated during this time, during the Enlightenment. So, um, so you know, I, always, I feel like if I censor those things, then... I'm kind of screwing myself. The play kind of derails. So sometimes you have to go against your own aesthetics and your own writing. It's a weird thing. Is it? Do I think it's interesting? You know, I wrote the play during in 2006. So I was really mad. So um, I don't know. I mean, ultimately, like yes, probably. <laughs> You know, but I think it's an interesting, I don't think there's such a thing as a doomed experiment, really, because you learn from it. So it can be a paradigm for something. And, you know, empires rise and fall. So everything ends. So everything's doomed in a way. You know what I mean? But it doesn't matter if it's doomed. It's like, what is it exactly? And what's, what is it, what's supporting it? And what is it supporting? And what's the ecosystem that makes it happen? And how are we a part of it? I mean, those are interesting questions to me.